Hello and good afternoon everyone. My name is Ida Hara and I'm going to be a senior at Bogan High School. And this summer I've been working in the Plant and Science Center's Ecology Lab with my mentors Rebecca Tonietto and Hannah King on methods for accurately surveying bee populations. So some facts about bees. There are about 25,000 species of bees worldwide and 4,000 of these bees are native to the U.S. However, honeybees are not native to the U.S. They were brought here by European settlers in the early 1600s for beeswax, porpoise, which is what they use to keep their beehives together, and it's also used in various medicines, and honey, since they are the only bees that produce honey. Um, bees live for about six weeks, with the exception of honeybees and some bumblebees. They can live for about a year, depending on if the bee is a male or female and what time of year was born, and their queens can live for about three to four years. Um, bees can pollinate thousands of flowers within their lifetime. For example, the southeastern blueberry bee can pollinate 50,000 blueberry flowers within its lifetime, and that's $20 worth of blueberries in the market, so that's so amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> bees have five eyes, three of which are light sensors. So as you can see here, this picture, bees don't, do not see like how we see. They actually see kind of, it's kind of flip-flop. They actually see more toward um, smaller wavelengths, wavelengths that we can, which we can't see. All we can see up to is um, like violet, but they can see ultraviolet, so they can see further down um, in the light spectrum, the small wavelengths. And we see high, and larger wavelengths, so more toward infrared, but not infrared. And what we put, uh, see as red the, um, up here. And these light sensors are important because it helps bees find nectar guys, which is <laughs> this flower. Here, so if we see a flower like this, and a bee sees a flower like this. What happens is the sun will exert UV rays, and once it hits the flowers, um, it will create this what is called a nectar guide, which is sort of kind of like a target for bees to find where to pollinate flowers. And once it's pollinated, the nectar guide will go away. Um, so the, these light sensors help them to find light. So when they know it's light outside, they know they can find flowers to pollinate. Um, bees eat pollen and drink nectar, and um, Bees, not only native bees, but honeybees too, pollinate half, more than half of the U U.S. crops. So these are a few of our native bees, from very small Pedita minima, which can be as big as the eye of a carpenter bee, to a very large carpenter bee, an impatient bumblebee. And you also have a sweat bee, who they named after, um, because it is attracted to human sweat for some reason, we don't know, <laughs> but it likes human sweat, and the wondering, Cuckoo bee, who they named after the cowbird. It goes into other bees' nests. Some bees are buried underground, and it would lay its eggs within that bee's nest, having its eggs hatch first and eat the bee's pollen. The pollen that was there for the, the bee, the first bee's larva, larva is getting eaten by this bee's baby. So, very mean bee. <laughs> <laughs> um, bees are being threatened across the world. Um, honeybees are the major concern because honeybees can pollinate more uh, like a lot of our crops. And they're calling, they've been going to seeing opening beehives and seeing that bees are missing and they're calling the colony collapse disorder. And there is no explanation for it. They don't necessarily know if it's a virus or if it could be um, pesticides, they don't know. But not only are honey bees declining, but our native bees are also declining. So with this happening, um, researchers have been using different methods to catch bees to take them back for research to see what is causing bees to decline. So two of these methods that we use are bee bowls, which are UV fluorescent colored bowls, and um, nets, which are kind of like a little nets that you can catch the bee in. The, it's really woven together tightly so that bees won't escape from it. Um, and my mentor, Rebecca Tonietto, was the first person to go out and use this use bee bowls at different heights in prairies. Now bee bowls have been, been used in, in different heights like rainforest and forest, but my mentor has been the first person doing it in prairies, which is awesome. Um, and once these bees are caught, they're taken back to the lab, cleaned, and sent off for research. So with this new bee bowl method going on, and people using them at different heights, I want to see if it actually was, was it necessary. So the question I came up with was, um, at what bee bowl height is zero meters or one meter will collect more bees? So my hypothesis was that bee, bee bowls at one meter will collect more bees because most, bees, no, most flowers are not um, on the ground, they're more elevated off of the ground, and bees fly the majority of the day, so they'll go for the flowers that are higher where they can see than the flowers that are lower or on the ground. 
So the materials I used for my project was three one meter dowels, six three ounce fluorescent bowls, soapy water, and whirl packs. And these are B bowls and these are whirl packs. Um, so I went out in the morning and I set up three dowels and put a bowl in each dowel, one white, one blue, and one yellow, and the corresponding color next to them. And I put soapy water in them and let them sit about for four to five hours because bees can walk on water because of surface tension. The soap breaks the surface tension and bees will drown. Um, then in the afternoon, I would collect the bees and I would put them in the whirl packs and bring them back to the lab to be counted. And this was done for about five days. So I was granted a plot in the, the Chicago Botanic Gardens Prairie. And um, this is what I collected. So as you can see, at one meter, there were more, more bees than at zero meter. So um, this could be that, like I said, most bees nest underground. So the ones that were nesting underground could have came out and just jumped in a zero meter bowl. And because um, they just saw it there. Um, but still, it was still more bees at one meter. Even the same type of bee that was in zero meters was in one meter. So that shows you that maybe they prefer the higher ones. So since this was done only for five days, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't a fluke. So we took some research that was collected by my mentor from Northeastern Illinois Prairies in 2010. And we took about 20 days and we still averaged out zero meters and one meter. And as you can see, one meter still had more bees than at zero meters. So, and it seems as though I really love the color blue. <laughs> They're really attracted to it. They're also attracted to yellow and white. Um, so overall, my hypothesis was supported by this data. Bebo's at one meter did collect more bees at zero meters. Um, and, and CGB prairie and in northeastern Illinois prairies. Um, so having bebo's at different heights can capture a more biodiversity among bees and not just collect one type of bee. Like I said, the bee that probably jumped into zero meters was one that's coming out of this nest and not all bees nest underground. Some bees have hives and some bees nest in like old logs. So is it better to have them at one meter where all bees can see them because they, not all bees nest underground, so not all bees will see the ones at the lower range. Um, so from the results that, I came, that I've got, um, bee bowls at different heights is an effective method toward catching bees. And this is recommended for scientists to collect accurate representative data for modeling bee populations. So they, they won't think that, oh, this, pop, this area here is many, this many bees or this many bees. They can know that it's probably more bees than just that than setting upon the ground and having a certain type of bee. Whereas if you put them up high, you might collect more bees, a more accurate biodiversity of bees. Um, future considerations, um, maybe to add more colors than just the colors I have, I'll have was blue, white, and yellow. And even though bees, those are the colors bees are more attracted to, they also can see a few other colors. Um, so it would be nice to have more colors and to use different heights. And um, it would also be nice to analyze more data from previous years, just to keep making sure that it was not a fluke and it was more accurate. So um, for the discussion, bees are very important to our ecosystem, whether we realize it or not. They provide us with food that we don't really think about if we didn't have. Um, we look at, oh, we can always get strawberries, we can always get blueberries, we can always get almonds, but without bees, then we won't have any of it, or we won't have much of it. Um, bees also help the economy, like I said earlier. Uh, one blue southern blueberry bee can produce $20 worth of blueberries in our market, so that's really important for our economy. And um, they also help to keep us healthy. We won't have um, fruits and vegetables without some bees, so, oh, not much of it in that matter. So they help to keep us healthy in a way. And bees are our friends, okay? So don't freak out when you see a bee like, kill it! It's, it's not, bees are not really vicious animals. Because think about it, they, most bees die after they sting people. I don't think if you only are going to live six weeks, you wouldn't really want to sting anyone. So don't, <laughs> don't kill the bee, just, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, try to escape if you're allergic, but. So these are some of the websites that I used. And I would like to thank Ben Durham and Murphy Thomas for being great instructors and helping me with my PowerPoint presentation and just giving me, showing me different things I've never known before in the classroom. So I thank you both so much. And I also really want to thank Rebecca Tonietto and Hannah King for taking the time out of their busy schedules for being two college students 
trying to get two different degrees and trying to work with me at the same time to help me with my project and having their own huge projects, which are very important. So I thank you so much. And I also want to thank Joan Osaganesi for giving me a plot in the Botanic Garden to work in because without her, I wouldn't have any of my own data. And I also would like to thank Shelly Bender for giving me the opportunity to be here at the Botanic Garden. I really appreciate it and it opened my eyes to a lot of new things. And I also like to thank the College First interns for giving me an awesome time here at the Botanic Garden this year. You guys are amazing. So, <laughs> are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> um, wow. Um, nice presentation. Um, while conducting this experiment, have you caught anything other than bees? I and mean, what have you done with it? Well, yes, I have caught things other than bees. Actually, I've been helping Edgar out with those Japanese beetles, uh, <laughs> getting rid of them, some of them. So, yeah, but yeah, I've caught other things, but we don't use them because they're not bees, and this is just specifically toward bees, so they get thrown away. Yeah. Edgar? Um, are you killing bees? <laughs> no, well, there are too many bees for me to try to kill all of them, so it's not like I just go out and die, bee, you know. It's, it's just this for like a short period of time is you're not just going out killing bees to kill bees and they are sent off for like research so that once the bee well once we capture the bee is sent off for research so that bees so we can know what's wrong with the bees so we can have them stop to stop dying so by themselves so yeah you're gonna kill them <laughs> <laughs> exactly oh, <laughs> wonderful idea <laughs> um any further questions <laughs>